Good morning. Let's all stand and turn to Psalm 307. Number 307, let's sing Revive Us Again. First, second, and the last on 307. Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, God, thankful to be in your house, God, and thankful to be back here, Lord, uh, around those like-minded, God, I pray, Lord, that we all take advantage of this time that we have together. What a privilege that this opportunity is, Lord, to be here and be in your house where we need to be, God. I pray, Lord, for those that aren't here for whatever reason, we continue to lift them up to you, God, we pray for them. We Pray for those on the prayer list, Lord, those that are sick and those in the nursing homes, God, and those uh, that maybe have lost loved ones, Lord. So many individual needs there that we just continue to lift up and put them in your hands, God, and ask that your will be done in all those things. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to watch over and bless Emmanuel Baptist Church, God. We pray, Lord, that we will see more people coming, we'll see membership decisions, that we'll see souls saved, God. We pray so very much for that, God, that if there's someone here this morning that knows you not as their Savior, that today would be the day uh, that they accepted you for that eternal salvation, that they would not leave here without making that uh, <coughs> critical decision here this morning, God. But we pray for our junior church and the Sunday school program across the way. We ask that you continue to watch over those kids and those teachers, and we thank you for what's going on over there. And we pray for that ministry to continue to grow, God, as well, Lord. Lord, pray for this service we pray for our preacher as he brings the message in a few minutes god i pray that you'll strengthen and speak through him speak through him and that we'll be ready to hear those words god and we will uh we'll internalize them we'll use them as we head out and face this old world this week and beyond that we pray all these things in your name amen, amen. thank you NBC. good to see everybody this morning I'm sure we're going to enjoy the message here in just a bit. Let's go to number 357 for our next song, and then we'll get the offering up. But 357 first, we'll sing Blessed Be the Name, all of them here, 357.
Brother Larry Martin, you will come up and take the offering up for us, please. Where would you lead us in a word of prayer? Most precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this Sunday morning service. God, I pray for this offering, Lord, that you just bless it. Father, I just pray for uh, all, of, all of our members here today, God, and all of those who couldn't be here. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for our preacher. Father, I thank you for our Sunday school teacher. Lord, I just thank you for giving us a place. God, you're good to us. God, I just ask you to watch over us, watch over our country, Lord, just help Help uh, all the members of this church, Lord, and all the Christians in the county, God, just be a light unto others so that they may see you, so that th they want to know what we have. Father, we let us show them what we have. Father, we just thank you. We pray you forgive us before we fail you, Lord. Just bless us here today in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's go to 106 for our next song. Number 106, let's sing Ready. We'll sing the first, second, and last. 106. supposed to read. It says a special thank you. Every kindness has a part in bringing joy to someone's heart. It's sometimes easy, easy to forget that there are nice people out there doing nice things for others. Thank you. Thanks for being such a special reminder. And then they write, we want to thank everyone who had a part in making our 50th celebration a success. But we appreciate you all uh, more, excuse me, we appreciate you all uh, more than you'll ever know. Our prayer is that God continues to bless as we go forward. Thanks again. This is from our preacher and our preacher's wife. So, uh, we certainly do appreciate everybody. Last week it was a good time celebrating 50 years of Emmanuel Baptist Church, that's for sure. Let's go to 364 before the special. Number 364, let's sing There Is a Name. I love to hear first, second, last on this one, 364. Thank you. 
fácil. Appreciate that. Turn with me to John in chapter 14. John in chapter 14 this morning. I'm going to talk to you about heaven this morning. I look out and I see that we're real thin this morning. And uh, a lot of the people change their vacations so that they could be here for the 50th. <coughs> anniversary and I appreciate I appreciate that that very much and I thank you for everything that you've done for Judy and I and the family I thank you very much in visiting with people and in fact uh, uh, remember to pray for Coretta okay I about forgot about that Coretta needs our prayer she uh, not feeling real good and so uh, remember to pray for for Coretta. A lot of people in visiting will say uh, different things about heaven. Uh, is it real? Uh, uh, how do you get there? What is heaven? Uh, how would you describe heaven and so on? So this morning I want to take the Bible, not not my not my thinking, not my philosophy on this here. But we're going to take the Bible this morning and show you what the Bible, the Word of God, has to say about heaven. And uh, I was studying this and I found where uh, an, an older gentleman in the ministry had made this remark. He said, a lack of knowledge is one cause of sorrow whenever we lose a loved one. And there's always sorrow and sadness when we lose a loved one. But it hurts more 
whenever we whenever we think, I wonder where they went to. I, I wonder what happened. I wonder if there is really a place called heaven. So the first thing, and I'm going to give you about five or six things this morning in this year. You can jot them down if you want to. But number one, I'm going to look at, and you hear this so much today, my, uh, and you'll find it, uh, some Christian folk are, are thinking or asking this today, is, is heaven a real place? Is heaven a real place? Yes. Yes, it's a real place. The, and the reason we say that is because the Bible says so. In John in chapter 14, notice Jesus speaking to His disciples. And He said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. Now, they, now He's been with them for a few years and they have the disciples and he uh, they and he's performed miracles and this and that and so on and he said you believe in God believe also in me all right now watch verse 2 and verse 3 are kind of the keys to it in my father's house are many mansions Jesus said if it were not so I would have told you so I go to prepare now watch this I go to prepare a place for you. And he said, And I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am there you may be also. So yes, he said, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you in this here. So it's not a state of mind. It's not some, some philosophy in this here. It is a real place heaven is in this here. Alright, now I look at this and I say, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Alright, now I, I don't know what kind of a place He's got for us, except He'll have a place for us whenever our time comes. But now to stop and to think about heaven, it is a place. Uh, Jesus said so. I prepare a place for you. Let's go to Revelation in chapter 21. And, uh, and notice what John is going to tell us over here. Whenever John is just about done uh, talking to us about, the, uh, about heaven and so on. And listen in, in Revelation in chapter 21. And we'll look at some things that will not be there and some things that will be in heaven. Now, in verse 1, you're going to see no more sea. Alright, most generally in the Bible, the sea talks about whenever you see something about the sea, uh, we're talking about troubles. We're talking about trials. Now listen to John. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Alright, so I look and I think, okay, uh, we, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't need a sea then because John said we don't have a sea. Alright, let's drop down a little bit and notice with me in verse 4 of this here. God shall wipe away all uh, tears from their eyes. Now, I'll tell you something. In this life, there's a lot of tears. In this life, there's a lot of sorrows in this here. But stop and think about it. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to a place for you, I will come again. Now, we're looking for Him to come in, in this here. And I look here and I find no more sheep. No more sea. Alright? Now look in verse 4. Wipe away all tears. God shall do this. Okay? Not John. But God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Therefore there will be no more death, neither uh, sorrow, nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. <clears throat> Very few of us sitting here this morning, but what we don't have, at least one little pain. Alright? Now think. No more pain. <clears throat> no more sorrow. No more sickness <coughs> in, in this here. Judy sometimes in the morning will say to me, uh, how are you today? Uh, and I'll say, well, uh, you know, um, I'm able to get up, able to go uh, in this here. Uh, sometimes this don't work right and that don't work right in this, but in heaven, yes. Everything is going to be great in heaven here. Look at verse 22, the same chapter. John said, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Isn't that something? Isn't that, isn't that something in this here? Look at 23. And he said, uh, 23, and, and the city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of, the, of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Think about that. No more sun. We look at the sun looking out this morning. The sun shining now in this here gives us light. But we don't need that because we have the sun. We're in, we're in a place like this here. Now, you say, well, okay, that's, uh, uh, that tells us that there will be no more sun, no more moon, uh, no temple, uh, no crying, no sorrow, no sadness, and all these here. But... Uh, Every once in a while, somebody will say this to you. I, I wonder whenever I die and I go to heaven, I wonder if there'll be room enough for me there. Have you, have you ever had anybody say that to you? I wonder, uh, I wonder if it'd be full whenever my time comes. I wish that's all I had to worry about. I wish that's all I had to think about in this here. Do you realize... Do you realize the the uh, uh, the size of heaven? You're in chapter 21 of Revelation. Look at verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> Listen to John again. And he that talketh with me had a golden reel to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square, and in the length it is large as a breath. And he measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. You know what he's talking about? 1,500 square miles. Do you have any idea? Look at the eastern part of America and you'll get an idea of this. Yes, there will be room for you and I in, in this here. So then I look at this and I say, there's a real place. Real place in, in this here. And then I get to thinking about what kind of a place uh, will it be? Uh, no sun, no moon. He's going, God's going to be the glory in this here. No sea, no sadness, no sorrow, no death, and on and on in, in this here. But what, what, what kind of a place will it be? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and or 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. And, uh, and chapter, what did I say? 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. And look at verse 9 uh, in, in this here. Now, when I get to thinking about this, I think about what a place that's going to be. Now, I can't describe it. All I can do is to take the Word of God and look and see what, what the Word of God has to say. I can't imagine 1,500 square mile. I can't imagine something like that. I can't imagine no sorrow. I, I just can't imagine this here. Well, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, 
And you've heard this many times at funerals. A lot of preachers will use this at, at the funerals. And what, what Paul is doing here, he's simply quoting the Old Testament in Isaiah and chapter 64 and verse 4. Listen to verse 9. As it is written, going back to Isaiah 64, I have not seen. He's going to use five things of the body, five factories of the body in this here. I have not seen, ear nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man or into the mind of man the things which God have prepared for them that love Him. <clears throat> for them that love Him. You say, I love the Lord. Do you really? Do I really love the Lord in this year? When I stop and I think about what heaven is going to be like, and it's indescribable as to what it's going to look like uh, in, in this year. The beauty uh, that is going to be there. No, no sin. Why? Why the... Why the problems and trials and tribulations in this life here? It's because of sin. In this, we can go all the way back to Genesis and chapter 3 in this here, and on and on and on. We uh, testing and all of these things here. But none of that in this here. Now, to stop and think about, look at Romans in chapter 8. You're not very far from there. Look at Romans in chapter 8 and listen to the Apostle Paul again in this here. Listen to him in verse 28. He said, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are uh, called according to His purpose. I, I can't look. I can't look very far ahead. I can think a little bit. But I can't look. I do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. I might think I know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I might up and plan for things tomorrow in this here. But it might not come to pass in, in this here. But to think, to think about, I'm going to live. I'm going to be in a place for we know that all things work for good for them that love God, that are called according to to His purpose in this here, God looks out and God says, I know tomorrow. I know the beginning. I know the ending of this thing here. You and I do not, you and I do not know this, but to think about, uh, about that in heaven, it's indescribable uh, what it's going to be like in a place of uh, heaven uh, in this here. And then sometimes a person gets a thinking about uh, when a when a person dies, when a person dies, when do they go to heaven? We're talking naturally about the saved person, and we'll get there in a little bit in this year. Whenever a person breathes the last time, what happens to them? What happens to them? Let's go to Second Corinthians again. You're not very far from there. And look at chapter 5 and verse 8. Listen to Paul uh, in, in this here. He said in verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Think about that. Man, I... I've been in the Lord's work for way many years in this and many times, many times I've thought about that and I can't find, I can't find where anybody talks about whether it's uh, a minute, two, three, or four, but he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Think about that. Think about that. I breathe my last time and I'm with I'm with the Lord. I'm in heaven in this here. No wonder Paul in Philippians in chapter one, listen to what the apostle Paul has to say 
in Philippians in chapter 1. Let's pick him up in, uh, oh, let's pick him up in verse uh, 21, 22, and 23. For me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain, Paul said. Alright? Now, notice something else. For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I was not. For I am in a strait betwixt. Look at this. Only Paul could write something like this. Only Paul. A man that, a man that was mean, ornery, that assault of Tarsus in this. But he got converted. He got saved on the road to Damascus. And man, did you ever realize, did you ever realize how much of the Bible the Holy Spirit let Paul write? Did you ever think about that? How much of the New Testament that he, that uh, the Holy Spirit allowed Paul to write in this here? Now, and Paul kept thinking about, he kept thinking about, man, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And they put him in prison. And I want to go home. And here he's in prison in Philippians here. Uh, in this here. Look at 23. For I am a straight betwixt. Having a desire to depart. And to be with God. He said which is far better in this here. Paul said man I, I'm in between this thing. I, I want to stay I want to stay and help the people. I want to stay and continue to write about this here. But oh, on the other hand, I want to go home with this. I don't know how many times. I don't know how many times I've thought about Brother Pierce. I'd go to the nursing home and see him and Brother Pierce would cry like a baby and he'd say preacher why won't Jesus call me home I'm ready I want to go why won't he and I'd look at him and I'd say I don't know brother Pierce I know the only thing I know is that he just not ready for you to come home you still got things to do uh, for him in this and he'd say what can I do here I am here I am lying in this bed. Can't get up uh, in, in this here. But you know what? I watched him. And I watched him as the nurses would come in. And that old boy, would he would testify. He'd give his, uh, uh, about his life and so on uh, in, in this thing here. I, I tell you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Can you imagine what it would be like leaving this sin-sick world with sorrow, sadness, sickness, death, all of these things here. Whoop! To be caught up together to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. I found this in studying. And I thought maybe at night it might uh, amuse you a little bit. In London, England in the 1800s, there was a man by the name of Solomon Pease. Solomon Pease. He knew he was going to die. So he goes downtown to the, the uh, people that made the stones for the graves. He goes down and he tells them what he wants on his tombstone okay we'll we'll do it and he goes and he pays him the fee for this year as time went long he passed away they took the body and they put the body down and and, and fixed the uh, tombstone and this is what it was on the tombstone <coughs> he said Beneath these, beneath these clouds and these trees lies the body of Solomon Pease. This is not, this is not Pease. It is only his pod. The pod has shelled out 
and gone to be with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it? It, and, and you know, there's a lot of, lot of truth in, in that. A one that many people think about, what are you and I going to do when we get to heaven? What are we going to do when we get to heaven? Now think with me. We, we, if we're not careful, we will get to thinking, well, i seen this cartoon. <coughs> and i seen this cartoon where uh, a man was floating along on a cloud. Okay. Uh, i seen where a man's walking along with a, a, a halo over his head in this here. Many people seem to think they're going to do nothing when they get to heaven. Oh, but we're going to do something. We're going to do something. Turn with me to Revelation in chapter 7. Revelation in chapter 7 and listen to, uh, uh, listen to verse 15 uh, in, in this here. Uh, chapter 7 and uh, look at verse 15 uh, in, in this here in Revelation in chapter 7 in this here therefore are, are they before the throne of God now watch this serve him day and, and serve him day and night in the temple we're going to serve him we're going to be obedient to Him. He's to, it's just like you and I have you and I have abilities. I can't play the piano. Uh, Levita can play the piano. Uh, Adelaide can play the piano. Sherry, on and on, so, several other people can play the piano. I I can't do that. So when I get home. I doubt very seriously if the Lord will have me playing the piano. But you know something? We're going to serve Him. He's going to have something for us to do that. Why? Why did Jesus up and spend so many verses in Matthew chapter 25? He, he gave us those verses there for us to read here and He's telling us, prepare when you get home. Because you're not going to sit around and twiddle your thumbs when you get home uh, in this year. You and I are going to serve Him. And and I could, in uh, what, in at Revelation chapter 14, there's other places you can go to uh, in this year. We will work, we will serve Him, and we'll never get tired. We'll never get tired uh, in serving Him in this year. We'll never... We'll never have a job that we regret uh, of this year. You know why? Because we don't have sorrow. We don't have sadness. We don't have sickness in, in heaven in this year. Now, I said to you a while ago, do you love Him? If we love Him, we're going to serve Him. And we're going to be obedient to Him uh, in, in this year. And so I look and I think, wonderful uh, in, in this here. Then another question that comes to our minds sometimes is that will we know each other in heaven? Will we know each other in heaven? Carolyn was telling about whenever uh, Ken Folk died and his wife had had been had went home uh, sometime before that, before he died, and, and uh, said the minister made the remark about her uh, banging on a t or a pan and saying uh, uh, that she was over there and so on. Said they laughed about it and so on. Uh, in in this here, and I and I'm, I'm probably probably right. Uh, uh, with her doing Carl that way. But anyhow, uh, will we know each other in heaven? Will we? And uh, 
uh, will will my name be Lloyd in heaven, uh, or will I have a different name? Will your will your name be uh, uh, Larry in heaven, or will we have an? I don't know, but I know this. I know that we're going to know each other. You say, well, how do how do you know that we're going to know each other in this here? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, most of you already know what, uh, what that is. That is the transfiguration. And uh, let's pick up in verse 1 of this here. And after six days, Jesus taken Peter, James, and John. Stop there for a moment. That is the... Uh, that is the inner circle of the apostles, okay? Uh, time and time again, you will find Peter, James, and John. Now, I would have loved to have been, uh, uh, I, I, I would have loved to have been one of the uh, uh, apostles. I, I surely would. Uh, but boy, just to stop and think about being in that inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Woo! What a what a thing that would be uh, in in this here. Uh, you want uh, you want some blessing from the Lord? Get in that inner circle uh, in in this here. How do we get in there? You look and you say, uh, uh, well, when I think about. When I think about this, I think about Peter. Uh, he wasn't perfect. No, he wasn't. Nor are you and I perfect uh, in this here. And John uh, loved him. And John, we know, uh, laid his head in the Master's bosom. What a great thing that would be. James, we know James, and he had the privilege of writing uh, an epistle in this here. Notice here is that taking his brother Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into the high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as a light. Isn't that something? We don't know what his face looked like. Why? Because it was the brightness of the sun in this here. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias or Elijah. Now notice talking with him. Now, notice as we go on. Then Peter, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to make thee three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias or Elijah. It's good thinking on Peter's part. Good, good thinking on this here. And yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you, hear, hear you Him in this here. We see something like this in the latter part of Matthew in chapter 3 while well, ago whenever of the baptism of our Lord in, in this here. So I look at this and I find Elijah and Moses. They knew each other. Now, think with me. Moses never seen Elijah. Moses lived thousands of years before Elijah came on the scene. Think about this here. And yet he knew. Yet he knew uh, in this here. And so I look at this and I think about uh, whenever we pick, uh, when we pick Moses up as a baby in, in the Nile River there. And we're going to find this young girl is going to take him, put him in a basket and you know What's going to? He's going to be raised up in in the Pharaoh's court, have everything that he wanted in in this here. But he makes a mistake, and he flees back into the uh, into the uh, 
uh, the, back into the uh, uh, desert, backside of the desert in Exodus in chapter 3, and so on. And God begins to work with him in this here. He's 80 years old in Exodus in chapter 3 in this here. And God says, Moses, now I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you in this here. You see, all of us have to have a little bit of training. We need some training. We need some spiritual training. I always look forward to Wednesday night, uh, Chaz reading the missionary letters uh, in this here, and I'll listen and I and I think about them talking about the disciple classes in this here. With all of my heart, I believe that we need that we need disciple classes in in this here. Well, Moses had quite a he had quite a class in this. Forty years taking care of old sheep. That's what he did. But when he got eighty, God called him to deliver the nation of Israel out of bondage. Moses died in the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, in in this here. Did we go for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? And we come we come to First Kings in chapter 17. Bam! Here is Elijah. Elijah, full grown. And he's ready to go to work for the Lord in that. But before he, before he does, God is going to try him. He's going to test him in this here. And you go up and you tell Ahab that it's not going to rain for some time in this. In fact, uh, it's not going to rain for three and a half years, James tells you, uh, in, in this here. And so Elijah had to learn. He had to learn to stay in the, in the rocks. He had to learn to go down and get the water at the brook and all of this here. And here we are at the Mount of Transfiguration and the transforming of our Lord in this here. And His face shined like this here. And they, these two knew each other in this here. I don't know whether we'll have the same names or not. I don't know about that, but I know we're going to know each other in this. You, know, you and I know this. We're going to have a glorified body. Do you ever think about, you ever think about that? Uh, we won't have a body like this one here. This one here is the pain, sorrow, sadness. We're limited as to what we can do with this body here. But when we get that glorified body, our Lord tells us of something about a glorified body in the last part of John and uh, uh, in the latter part of Luke in this here. He tells us about this, but I've got to hurry. Uh, one other thing. How does a person get there? How does a person get to heaven? Go back with me to John in chapter 14. John in chapter 14 and we're going to see how a person is going to get there. We hear all kinds of things. That's the reason why that I wanted this book, this Holy Word, I wanted it to speak to our hearts this morning and show you uh, in, in this here. We may read where, uh, if so, if you will up and you read the Bible through, you'll get to heaven. But the Bible doesn't have to say. If... Uh, if you will, if you'll try to keep the Ten Commandments, uh, you you can make it. But none of us can keep the Ten Commandments uh, in in this here. If I'll be faithful and be obedient, uh, then I'll go to heaven. But it doesn't tell you uh, this here. What is it that Jesus said? And going back to what he says in John in chapter 14. And notice with me. Well, uh, uh, let's let's pick up in verse uh, uh, verse three, four, five, and six. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now he's going to come back, 
and the next time he comes back, he's going to rapture the saints out of here. Uh, that you and I would look at and call that the rapture of the church. All right? And receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful to think about? I'll be with Jesus. You know what? I'll be with Him forever. Not just, not just a, a, a little while. All of us have experienced a little bit about a little <clears throat> dab of heaven here. All of us have. And we probably said to ourselves, Oh, I just wish we could stay here uh, like this. But we can't. But we will one day if we do what He says in this here. Alright? Then no, notice Tom... Uh, and whether I go, you know, and the way you, you and and thy way, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how we know. <clears throat> Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? Good question. Thomas has got a great question. In this, Jesus said unto him, He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And he said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In order for you and I to get to heaven, we've got to come to Jesus. We've got to come and do what Jesus said in, in this. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come unto the Father except by me. Jesus lived in the celestials of heaven at anything. And then in the book of Hebrews in chapter 7 it says that He had a body prepared. And that body was uh, to come to this, it, this earth. He was born in a manger. The backside of a, uh, of a cave he was born there and uh, no glory, nothing like this. He lived in poverty and then he goes. He goes one day. They arrest him. They spit upon him. They f have false accusations against him. All of this here. And then they nail him to a cross. They chuck that cross down in the ground and there he is. And He's going to die for you and for me. The writer of Hebrews said, with shedding of blood, there's no remission <clears throat> of sin. He shed His blood that you and I might have life eternal in, in this year. How can a person, how could a person say no to Jesus whenever Jesus up and gave His life, that you and I might have eternal life in this. In John in chapter 19, He's, he's coming down to the end of, of His life, hanging on that cross, and then He says this, It is finished. It is finished. I gave my life that they might have life. That you and I might have life. Are you saved this morning? Are you ready to go to heaven? If death would touch you this morning, would you would you go to heaven? Do you know do you know that you would that you would do that? This thing is serious. Goodness gracious, this is a serious business. Uh, in this year. If you've been in our Sunday school class this morning, you'd have heard Chaz talk about salvation, how important salvation is. It's so important that God sent His only begotten Son to die upon the cross that you and I might have life. Will you come this morning if you're not saved? Will you step out this morning and come to this old-fashioned altar. Let's bow our heads in prayer.
Oh, Lord, I pray I've done you right this morning. Oh, I thank you for heaven. I thank you for dying upon the cross. And I look out over this congregation this morning, Lord, and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful, Lord, that our people have up and trusted you and asked you to save them. And I think about where they're at today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, speak to hearts. May we do what you'd have us to do today. Forgive us of our sins. For I ask it in thy precious name. Amen. Let's stand and go to 375. 375, just as I am.